and Salam Malaysia Madani. You're watching News at 10. I'm Jessica Lee. Making the headlines tonight. EPF collateral for loans does not violate existing act. Government looking to improve national film policy. Now, the method of allowing contributors to use the funds in the Employees Provident Fund, or EPF, as collateral for bank loans does not violate the EPF Act, according to Prime Minister Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim. Now, he said the matter had been discussed with the EPF and there were no obstacles to implementing it. Tapi ada satu beberapa kes, apa yang saya sebut, kalau dia dengar ucapan saya itu, Maksudnya ada yang kes yang mendesak umpamanya walaupun dia ada wang tapi dia tidak boleh umpamanya bayar penguruan uh, pendidikan anak dia di luar negara. Kes-kes seperti itu dia teliti lah. Tapi kita tak benar akan diambil daripada KWSP dan syarat-syaratnya itu ketat. Datuk Sri Anwar, who is also Finance Minister, said that the method is to help certain cases. He announced in a Dewan Rakyat on Thursday that the government would introduce a method that would allow contributors who are in dire straits to take up loans from a bank with a collateral from their EPF. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister revealed that any decision by the Perak government regarding water supply to Pulau Pinang will be studied in detail. Datuk Sri Anwar said any decision by Perak, including wanting to prioritise the state's needs first before supplying water to Pulau Pinang, is a policy that needs to be respected. Kaji secara yang agak ilmiah dan saintifik. Sukses dalam perbincangan dulu kerana tentunya Perak beri keutamaan untuk keperluan negeri Perak. Itu tak ada salah sebagai dasar. Tapi kita tengok kalau apakah benar dan lebihan yang banyak, apakah unjuran dia untuk keperluan 5 tahun, 10 tahun, itu semua dikaji secara yang agak ilmiah dan saintifik. Okay? Kemudian baru buat keputusan. He said this to reporters after officiating the national level World Water Day 2023 celebration at the Indra Mulia Stadium in Ipoh. Themed Accelerating Change, the event was also attended by Natural Resources, Environment and Climate Change Minister Nick Nazmi Nick Ahmad. Datuk Sri Anwar said this when asked about Para not being ready to negotiate with Pulau Pinang regarding supplying water to its neighbouring state. On the 1st of December last year, Para Menteri Besar Datuk Sri Saharani Mohamad said that the state would not supply water to Pulau Pinang even though the state government is now comprised of Barisan Nasional and Pakatan Harapan representatives. On another note, Datuk Sri Anwar said the fire and rescue team plays the role of not only saving lives and property, but also reducing the losses incurred by the country. Now, according to the Premier, the speed and efficiency of firefighters in putting out fires had minimised damage to properties. Therefore, Datuk Sri Anwar, who is also Finance Minister, said the government would never hesitate in adding allocations to the department every year to ensure their services are always improved. Jadi, bila saudara pergi pantas selamatkan satu rumah kedai atau selamatkan satu factory, itu bermakna sumbangan saudara kepada ekonomi negara kerana kita tidak bergantung, tidak terpaksa menanggung kerugian. Jadi, anak-anak muda yang dalam pasukan bomba ingat untuk Bukan saja menyelamatkan nyawa, menyelamatkan harta benda, tapi membantu memacu pertumbuhan ekonomi. He said this when opening the Tambun Fire and Rescue Station today. Now also present was local government development minister Nga Ko Ming. Datuk Sri Anwar also praised the performance of the fire and rescue department as a whole, which is considered to be at the best level. 
The Ministry of Communications and Digital, or KKD, is looking at aspects of the national film policy that can be improved in efforts to stimulate the development of the country's creative industry post-COVID-19. Now, Mr. Fami Fazel said it involves several specific matters, not only related to local creative industry players, but efforts to attract foreign production companies to Malaysia. He said the move is important to empower the sector, which has the potential to attract foreign investors in the next few years with an estimated value of over 1 billion ringgit. Bila kita dapat uh, uruskan beberapa perkara di peringkat Kementerian dan Finas uh, bersama-sama dengan uh, Kementerian Keuangan, saya percaya kita akan dapat tambah baik uh, program FIMI. Ya, dan uh, insya Allah uh, pihak Kementerian juga akan meneliti beberapa perkara kerana uh, kita bukan hanya nak filem-filem uh, 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 yang uh, produksinya dari luar ya, untuk uh, manfaatkan fasiliti di sini, kemudahan di sini uh, tapi juga produksi-produksi uh, syarikat-syarikat uh, produksi tempatan. Ya. He added after the pandemic, there is a need to recalibrate the industry through what the government can offer through initiatives coupled with wider marketing to the industry. He said this to reporters after visiting Iskandar Malaysia Studios in Johor today. Nafami said the ministry is always open for discussions with industry players related to matters arising from the challenges that they face. A hotel in Sandakan is the first in the country to offer Rahma accommodation package during the coming month of Ramadan. Domestic Trade and Cost of Living Minister Del Sri Salahuddin Ayyub said the Rahma initiative offered in the hospitality service can directly promote the tourism industry for both domestic and international tourists. He said the Domestic Trade and Cost of Living Ministry, or KPDN, is expanding the Rahma initiative to other services. This Rahma initiative, according to Datuk Sri Salahuddin, is now not limited to food menus, cafes and sales, but has also expanded to the hospitality, banking and insurance services. Satu lagi berita gembira untuk rakyat Malaysia dan langsung akan dapat mempromosi pelancongan sama ada di peringkat antarabangsa dan juga pelancong tempatan. Dan saya lepas ini akan lebih bersemangat lagi. Saya akan cuba untuk melibat urus dengan beberapa pengusaha hotel supaya lebih banyak lagi uh, pakej uh, ramah bagi industri perhotelan akan dapat kita tawarkan kepada rakyat. He said this to reporters after launching the Rahma package offered by the Yolopura Hotel in Sandakan today. Earlier, Dr. Sri Salahuddin, when launching the menu Rahma at the Maidin supermarket nearby, said based on the feedback from traders, the initiative has become a crowd puller for them. Now, so far, he said a total of 1,531 business premises nationwide have registered with KPDN to participate in the initiative. Team financial support initiatives for flood affected students. The Ministry of Education, or MOE, has introduced 18 financial support initiatives specifically for students affected by the flood disaster. Its Minister Fadlina Siddiq said the aid could only be given after an application for assistance is received because the form of aid would be according to the applicant's needs. Commenting further on the matter, Fadlina said the ministry has prepared various forms of schooling aid, adding that applications submitted to the school will be considered by state and district education officers. Yang paling kritikal adalah banjir. Jadi akan ada isu-isu tentang uh, buku sekolah, pakaian seragam, uh, dan juga yang terkait rapat dengan uh, makan minum mereka dan juga kebajikan-kebajikan lain. Kita ada 18 inisiatif uh, kewangan uh, yang boleh kita uh, dahulukan dalam konteks uh, untuk membantu mereka yang paling penting mereka dapat meneruskan pengajian. She said the ministry has issued a new circular regarding school preparation in the first week with teachers focusing on programs or activities to get familiar with their students and make them feel at ease in school. 
She says students affected by the floods do not need to come to school in their uniforms, adding that no lessons will be conducted in the first week. A total of 81.2% of the 9,507 vocational college graduates have succeeded in obtaining employment, which is a proud achievement. The education minister said having the, the confidence and specific skills make vocational college graduates competitive and able to fill positions in the private sector and move as industry-leading skilled workers. Kadar keboleh pasaran graduan kolej uh, vocational bagi tahun 2021 adalah sebanyak 99.16%. Manakala sebanyak 81.2% graduan tahun 2022 yang bergradu, bergraduat pada 6 hingga 12 Mac telah pun mendapat pekerjaan sebelum uh, convocation ini lagi. Jadi um, saya merakamkan rasa bangga uh, kepada semua graduan pada hari ini dan khususnya kepada kolej vocational di bawah Kementerian Pendidikan Malaysia ini uh, kerana kerana beberapa uh, faktor yang cukup signifikan, uh, pastinya kerana keboleh pasaran mereka ini uh, hampir dijamin. Fadlina said this after officiating the 7th Ministry of Education Vocational College Convocation Ceremony 2022 in Nilai today. A total of 9,507 graduates from 81 vocational colleges nationwide received their diploma scrolls and 33 of them were awarded the best students for their respective programs with one receiving the Minister of Education Gold Award. The selection process of adoptive parents is tightened to ensure that they are truly qualified and suitable. Now, in this regard, Women, Family and Community Development Minister Dr. Sri Nancy Shukri said a new guideline book was introduced as a reference to evaluate the eligible parties to be the guardians of the children. Elaborating further, Dr. Sri Nancy said the guidelines were created to ensure the placement suitability of children under adoptive parents or people who are qualified and suitable. She said under the guidelines, the Department of Social Welfare has introduced a screening system for the personality psychological assessment, which is a psychological measurement tool designed to provide scientific data about an individual's thoughts, feelings and behaviour. She added through the assessment, the suitability of adoptive parents in the aspect of care and protection of children can be examined in more detail. Inilah test diberi kepada orang yang sangguplah komit itu, dia komit. Tapi sama ada dia layak ke tidak, dia komit tapi layak ke tidak, itu akan menjadi tanggungjawab uh, pelindung kita untuk mengenal pasti sama orang ini ada dia punya uh, chemistry ke tidak dengan anak-anak ini. Now, the number of patients suffering from non-communicable diseases, or NCDs, and chronic kidney disease, CKD, is now very worrying, with more than 9,000 patients identified as having to undergo dialysis treatment every year. Now, Health Minister Dr. Zaliha Mustafa said statistics from a local study also found that one in seven Malaysians suffer from CKD, showing that it needs to be taken Seriously. Accordingly, she said the government is very committed to fighting the increase of NCDs and focusing on the prevention of CKD under the national health agenda. Tumpuan utama kementerian adalah untuk mengubah penjagaan pesakit iaitu seek care kepada penjagaan kesihatan iaitu health care dengan memperluaskan promosi ataupun promotive health dan pencegahan iaitu preventif penyakit sebagai sebahagian daripada fokus baru terhadap pengurusan NCD. She said this when inaugurating the national level World Kidney Day 2023 in Nilai today. She said the 2019 National Health and Morbidity Survey found that 1.7 million individuals in the country suffer from three main NCDs, namely diabetes, hypertension and high cholesterol, while another 3.4 million suffer from a combination of any of the two NCDs. In addition to addressing growing health concerns, Dr. Zaleha said the ministry is also committed to producing a health white paper to realise the aspirations and reforms of the health agenda. 
with us. She asked the people to adopt a healthy lifestyle and carry out regular checkups to ensure health is always at an optimal level, in addition to seeking immediate treatment for those who are ill. The Health Ministry, MOH, has allocated 9.3 million ringgit to renovate and upgrade 38 dilapidated health clinics in Kelantan this year. Its Deputy Minister, Lukanisman Awang Sauni, said the allocation was approved by the government under the Budget 2023 to reduce overcrowding in hospitals. He said the renovation project of these rundown clinics can improve services at the primary health care level, thus reducing congestion in hospitals because early and light treatment can be done at health clinics first. He said this when met after the Tanamera Hospital Extension Construction Project handover ceremony today. The construction of Tanamera Hospital's additional building, costing 153.2 million ringgit, will begin on the 1st of May in phases and benefit over 400,000 residents in the surrounding areas. Luca Nisman also said that he was informed by the Public Works Department that there are four more health facility projects in Kelantan to be completed in April this year. The two of the projects are in Kuala Krai, namely the Karangan Health Clinic, the Peria Health Clinic and Quarters, and another one each in Machang and Tanamera, the Mata Eye, Eye Health Clinic and Quarters and the Sokor Health Clinic and Quarters. In addition, he said Bacho Hospital is expected to be completed by next October and will be fully operational in early 2024. Next, Indonesia's Merapi volcano erupts, covers villages in ash. Indonesia's Mount Merapi, one of the world's most active volcanoes, erupted today, spewing out smoke and ash that blanketed villages near the crater. Now, the country's disaster mitigation agency said there were no immediate reports of casualties. The Merapi Volcano Observatory estimated the ash cloud reached 3,000 metres above the summit. Authorities established a restricted zone of 7 kilometres from the crater after the eruption, which was recorded at 12.12 p.m. local time. To anticipate potential danger from Mount Merapi eruption, agency spokesperson Abu Muhari said in a statement that the public is advised to stop any activities in the potential danger area. The nearby residents were also told to expect disruptions from ash and be aware of potential dangers from volcanic mud flow, particularly if it rains near the volcano. An officer at one of Merapi's observation posts said at least eight villages near the volcano have been affected by volcanic ash. The volcano's last major eruption in 2010 killed more than 300 people and forced the evacuation of some 280,000 residents. Li Qiang took office today as China's premier, the country's number two post, putting the close ally of President Xi Jinping in charge of reviving an economy battered by three years of COVID-19 curbs. Widely perceived to be pragmatic and business-friendly, the 63-year-old Li faces the daunting task of shoring up China's uneven recovery in the faces of global headwinds and weak confidence among consumers and the private sector. Li takes office as tensions rise with the West over a host of issues, including U.S. moves to block China's access to key technologies and as many global companies diversify supply chains to hedge their China exposure due to political risks and the disruptions of COVID era. The career bureaucrat replaces Li Keqiang, who is retiring after two five-year terms during which his role was seen to be steadily diminished as Xi tightened his grip on power and steered the world's second largest economy in a more status direction. The analyst said Li Qiang is the first premier since the founding of the People's Republic never to have served previously in the central government, meaning he may face a steep learning curve in the initial months on the job. 
C is installing a slate of loyalists in key posts in the biggest government reshuffle in a decade as a generation of more reform-minded officials retires. Now, Japan has given the assurance that the discharge of treated water into the sea from the destroyed Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant this year is safe and secure, and it will not impact Malaysia. An official of Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry said the treated water released to the sea would be limited to the area within three kilometres from the power station based on a simulation. Therefore, there will be no impact on Malaysia. Exactly 12 years ago, on the 11th of March 2011, a massive 9.0 magnitude earthquake and tsunami killed 15,900 people. The Great Earthquake and Tsunami also triggered a nuclear catastrophe at the Fukushima plant. Now, Japan has been taking all necessary precautions ahead of plans to discharge treated water, as evidenced by Fukushima's progress on safety and reconstruction since the incident 12 years ago. At the plant, water containing radioactive materials, which is purified and treated to meet regulatory standards for radioactive materials, except for tritium, is called ALPS treated water. The stored water treated with the ALPS technology and equipment would remove radionuclides, with the exception of tritium. The timing of the discharge of the ALPS treated water into the sea is expected to be from spring to summer of this year. Startup-focused lender SVB Financial Group became the largest bank to fail since the 2008 financial crisis in a sudden collapse at Royal Global Markets, left billions of dollars belonging to companies and investors stranded. California banking regulators closed the bank, which did business as Silicon Valley Bank, and appointed the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation as receiver for later disposition of its assets. Now, based in Santa Clara, the lender was ranked as the 16th biggest in the United States at the end of last year, with about $209 billion in assets. Specifics of the tech-focused bank's abrupt collapse were a jumble. But the Fed's aggressive interest rates hikes in the last year, which had crimped financial conditions in the startup space in which it was a notable player, seemed front and centre. As it tried to raise capital to offset fleeing deposits, the bank lost $1.8 billion on Treasury bonds, whose values were torpedoed by the Fed rate hikes. Silicon Valley's bank's failure is the largest since Washington Mutual went bust in 2008, a hallmark event that triggered a financial crisis that hobbled the economy for years. The 2008 crash prompted tougher rules in the United States and beyond. to roll out Safe Sports Code this Wednesday. The Ministry of Youth and Sports, KBS, will introduce the Safe Sports Code this Wednesday, which includes the safety aspects when dealing with sexual harassment, bullying and violence. As Mr. Hannah Yeo said, the code, which was previously in the research phase, is now ready to be fully implemented by her ministry. She said the ministry will make a special announcement about the code. According to her, the issue of safe sports is not only for women, but also for men. Because apart from the issue of sexual harassment, it also involves bullying and violence. The code, which includes a code of conduct, will be used to handle complaints about sexual harassment in the sports industry before being replaced by the Safe Sports Act in the future. Spanish prosecutors have filed a complaint against Barcelona and two of the La Liga club's ex-presidents over alleged payments to a company owned by a senior refereeing official to influence match results. Now, the Public Prosecutor's Office is said yesterday that a judge has yet to decide whether to take up the case. 
The club allegedly paid over 7.3 million euros between 2001 and 2018 to firms owned by Jose Maria Enrique Negrera, who was vice president of the refereeing committee of the Spanish Football Association in 1993 to 2018. Prosecutors claim that under a secret agreement and in exchange for money, Negreria favoured Barcelona in the decisions taken by referees in the games played by the club, as well as in the results of the competitions. The club denied wrongdoing in a statement last month. The complaint focuses on the 2.9 million euros paid between 2014 and 2018 and alleges that Barcelona, with the help of former presidents Sandro Rosell and Josep Maria Bartomeu, reached a confidential verbal agreement with Negreria. It accuses the club, Rosell, Bartomeu, Negreira and two other former Barcelona officials of corruption in sports, unfair administration and falsehood in mercantile documents. Paris Saint-Germain will submit a bid for the country's largest stadium, the Stade de France, as they look to move from their Parc de France home. Now, Paris Mayor Anne Hildalgo said the Parc de France was not for sale, which prompted PSG to say in January that they would explore alternative options for their home stadium. The Ligue 1 champions said they will submit a bid for the Stade de France but added that their preferred option remains a renovated Parc de France. The Parc de France, owned by the Paris City Council, has been PSG's home since they entered the top flight in 1974. The lease for the Stade de France is held by a consortium of the French companies Vinci and Boyes with any buyout of the stadium set to take place after 2025. The arena opened its doors in 1998 and the venue of the World Cup final that year was won by the hosts. It will also stage track and field events at the Summer Olympics in 2024. A PSG have been the most successful club in France since Qatar Sports Investments took over in 2011, winning the league eight times. They have also had success in France's domestic cup competitions but have failed to win the Champions League. Final item on tennis, the fifth seeder Daniel Medvedev, fresh off three straight ATP victories in Rotterdam, Doha and Dubai, continued his red-hot form with a 6-4, 6-3 victory over American Brandon Nakashima at the Indian Wells Open. Medvedev entered the tournament as the ATP's tour's most informed player, winning three consecutive titles and 14 straight matches. And his winning streak, now at 15, was never in jeopardy thanks to an assured performance against the San Diego native. Medvedev did not face a break point in the first set, but had to fight off half a dozen in an entertaining second set before closing it out with his third break of Nakashima's serve. Nakashima gave his home crowd plenty to cheer about, firing big forehands and defending brilliantly at times, and even hitting a tweener that his opponent volleyed into the net in set two. But Medvedev had all the answers when he needed them, as the Russian tennis player secured the win in one hour, 26 minutes, at the year's first ATP Masters 1000. Medvedev will next face Belarusian Ilya Ivashka, who moved past 28th seed Botish van der Zanschlup when the Dutchman retired while trailing 5-7-2-3. And that's it for News at 10. In our top story, EPF collateral for loans does not violate existing act. Join us again at 12.30 tomorrow afternoon. I'm Jessica Lee. Thank you for joining us. Good night.